think they got any chance to win the series. They might win two games. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Well, I watched them work out this morning, and the Russians are real good skaters, but I think the Canadian boys will take them. <laughs> Team Canada, 74. The underdogs with the Canadian public and the press. Selected players from the World Hockey Association. The National Hockey League and its players said no when Hockey Canada invited them to join forces. Team Soviet, 74. The very best players in the entire USSR. A country where there appears to be no conflict of interest when it comes to icing the strongest possible team when so much sporting prestige is internationally at stake. It's Canadian hockey versus Soviet hockey. The founders versus the refiners. It's truly hockey versus hockey. Mr. Trudeau and Soviet Deputy Chairman of Sport, Georgi Rigulski, shared the ceremonial face-off duties. In just a moment, we find out if Team Canada 74, whose players went to their Edmonton training camp only 16 days before, could cope with the mighty Soviet hockey machine. Kind of a different atmosphere here. There's not as many players. I think everybody's going to get a good chance here, and everybody's going to be in better condition, I think, than we were the last time. And uh, I think we know what to expect now. Um, most of us, everybody's been watching them for years, and uh, I don't think we'll underestimate them this time. Frank Mohavlich played in 1972 when Canada defeated the Soviets in a dramatic eight games. So did defenseman Pat Stapleton. We have the experience of uh, being able to look back at what happened in the last series and uh, being able to study the movies. Going into the last series, it was like playing an unknown team for an unknown quantity. And, uh, as it turned out, it took a while to adjust. Even the intervention of Prime Minister Trudeau couldn't make this next fellow eligible with the NHL Team Canada of 1972. I don't think I've ever been to a camp where I've seen a greater group of guys with a better attitude than I have right here in Hockey Canada. It's just been fantastic. And if, if, if attitude means anything, and I know we all know it means a great deal, we're certainly going to be ready. Nobody doubted their attitude. The question was, how could Team Canada be in shape, in condition to skate with these well-prepared Soviets after only 16 days of training camp? The Soviet lineup had several familiar names. Forwards, Valery Kalamo, Boris Mikhailov, Alexander Maltsov, Alexander Yakushev, and goalie, Vladislav Kretje, players who'd won the utmost respect of Canadian hockey in recent years. Team Canada's most notable names included Jerry Cheevers in goal, Pat Stapleton on defense, along with veteran J.C. Tremblay, and up front, Paul Henderson, the previous Canada-Russia series scoring hero. Bobby Hull, and Frank Mahovlevic, Ralph Baxter, and a 46-year-old miracle man, Gordy Howe. It's the second period now, with Canada leading 2-1. to one. And number 17, Valery Karlamov, scores one of the most spectacular goals of the entire series. Here's that pattern that Karlamov peak again. A remarkable goal by a remarkable player who earlier in the game had a spectacular collision with Rajan Hul. In recent years, there's been much talk about new and different Soviet tactics, but very little explanation. 
That's one reason why Hockey Canada arranged to film this series using full zone camera coverage. Later in this film, we'll take a careful look at Soviet strategies. Into the third period now, the Soviets leading 3 to 2. But number 16, Bobby Hull, ties the game and sends this Quebec crowd into ecstasy. The Colisee was enraptured. Here was Team Canada 74, outskating and outshooting the Soviets in the third period when everybody predicted they'd run out of gas. With just about half a minute to play, number 27, Frank Mahavlich, had an excellent try for the winning goal. The game ended 3-3, three three, a fitting wind-up to a well-played match. Played in a style in line with Health and Welfare Minister Mark Lalonde's luncheon remarks to the two teams the day before. The relations between the Canada and the Union Soviet during the dernières années have connu an expansion sans précédent. The relations between Canada and the Soviet Union during recent years has known an unprecedented expansion. And there is no doubt that sport is an element extremely important in the development of these relations. In the last few years, we've had the pleasure to receive representatives of the USSR in a number of sports, not only hockey. And these competitions that took place in Canada and Russia have contributed greatly in cementing the friendly relations between our two great nations. So in conclusion, I will only say to both teams on behalf of the government of Canada and on behalf of all Canadians, best of luck to you all. And uh, we stand behind both teams. <laughs> Game two was in Toronto, and this standing ovation was for the inspirational Gordie Howe. Tonight, his 19-year-old son, Mark, was in the Team Canada lineup, too. And father and son, together with Ralph Baxter, opened the scoring with a beautiful passing play. The puck goes from Mark to Gordie, back to Mark, to Baxter. Here it is. Who says Canadian players have forgotten how to pass? The Howes and Backstrom emerged as Team Canada's most consistent forward line over the balance of the series. Face-offs was one area where Team Canada dominated the Soviets throughout the eight games. And Andre Lacroix wins this one, and then is right in position to make it 2-0 for Canada. In the second period, with the score three to one for Canada, Vladimir Petrov scored a goal that hardly anybody saw. As we see it again, the puck was in and out in a fraction of a second. This would have made it three to two and may have affected the eventual outcome. Canadian referee Tom Brown, however, did not see the goal. When he consulted with the goal judge who had put the red light on, the goal judge showed some hesitation. And so Brown ruled no goal. While on the subject of officiating, a certain amount of chippy play crept into this game. Players weren't always stopping on the whistle. Team Canada took a one-game lead in the series. And as the two teams jetted to Winnipeg for game three, a lot of people who predicted the Soviets would win all eight games were busy rewriting their scripts. I think we'll win it all. Oh, I think they've got a real good team. You can't beat Bobby Hull and Cheevers and Gordie Howe, and uh, Stapleton's fantastic. These are guys that are really working together, and uh, I think we're going to win all the games. Don McLeod took over in goal for Team Canada this night, one of five lineup changes gambled on by Coach Billy Harris. And Team Canada fired five goals. Bruce McGregor. again. And Serge Bernier. But the 
the Soviets bombarded McLeod with a barrage of eight goals. Alexander Yakushev, Boris Mikhailov, Vladimir Petrov, Alexander Maltsev, Vladimir Shadrin, Alexander Fodanov, Yakushev again, and Yuri Lebedev. It was number 15, big Alexander Yakushev, who really got the Soviets into orbit in this game. This sequence from game two shows the concentration and discipline of this great Soviet star. Nothing can deter him from his task. Later in the series, Bobby Hull, a player who should know, called Yakushev the greatest left winger in the world. It showed today that the Soviet team does have a definite edge in conditioning. And I think uh, today, with the, as I said, the three games coming in a short period of time, uh, it took more out of us. The first two games took more out of us than it did out of the Soviet team. And one wonders how much Team Canada missed those five players who sat out. Victor Dombrovsky, a Russian referee, handled this game in Winnipeg. And the chippiness, which sprouted in game two, grew more prevalent. And so Winnipeg was the site of the highest scoring game of the series, eight to five. And now, after three games, the teams were all even. Vancouver welcomed the teams with 85 degree weather. The Soviets seem to be enjoying the newspaper accounts of their previous night's triumph. Among other things. As we invade the privacy of Team Canada's dressing room prior to game four, you'll note how and Sheevers are back in the lineup. But Billy Harris stoutly defended his game three substitutions. My feelings are that each player, there's 27 players on the club, they've uh, given up six weeks to this project uh, as far as the camp is concerned. Some of them have given up two and a half months preparing for the, the series. And uh, I have an obligation as coach that uh, each player is entitled to take part in the series. And if I had to do over again, and uh, I'd do exactly the same thing. In the first period, Gordy Howe scored on a play that again featured passing and shooting par excellence. Stapleton, to Mark Howe, to Gordy, who beat Stretziak with a well-aimed shot, tying the score at one off. Big number nine just shown Tretiak and the world why he's professional hockey's all-time scoring champion. Team Canada beat Tretiak four more times within a span of five minutes and still in the first period. Three of the goals by Bobby Hull. That tied the score, 2-2. 3-2 two -two. Two for Canada. And with a Mahavlich goal just before this one, it was now 5-2. The high-powered hull had been explosive in the earlier games as well. He now had six goals in four games, playing on a gimpy knee that would have sidelined a less competitive spirit. But Bobby'd missed one chance to play for Canada through no fault of his own, and he wasn't passing up this opportunity. Alexander Yakushev narrowed it to 5-3 to three in the second period. However, Team Canada seemed clearly in control of the game. 
But Polish referee Waldos Czapek was having his problems. The play was getting unnecessarily rough. Either Czapek didn't see all that was happening, or the international officiating standards differ greatly from what Canadian professionals are accustomed to. In the third period, number 19, Vladimir Shadrin, took a spear in the back of the knee. The referee missed that infraction. But at the very next opportunity, Shadrin retaliated with a slash against Johnny McKenzie. And off he went. This was typical. Missed the original offender, but penalized the offended retaliator. In any event, Team Canada seemed to forget about hockey. But the Soviets didn't. With less than three minutes to go, they scored twice. Alexander Maltsev, then Alexander Gusev. escape with a 5-5 tie. Both teams could smile at the post-game banquet. The Soviets lucky to be returning to Russia on even terms after generally being outplayed in three of the four games in Canada. Team Canada happy to be even after four games when most people had given them so little chance. But the Soviets' dramatic comeback here in Vancouver had spoiled a night that otherwise belonged to the classy Bobby Hull. It's been a, a terrific thrill for me. And I know that for the last couple of years, in the first series, some of we have been which we certainly would like to have done because these fellows on our right here are just fantastic athletes and I admire every one of them. And it's been a great experience for me and I know that my wife and her mother, my mom and dad, will have a great time over in the Soviet Union. And again, I say it's been my extreme pleasure to play for Finland was Team Canada's next stop. Eight days separated games four in Vancouver and five in Moscow. Team Canada, plus their wives and relatives, spent most of this time here in Helsinki, where they were hosted by Canada's ambassador, Cote, and his wife. Oh, yes. yes, glad to see you. You got any more last minute tricks up your sleeve? Oh, no, to see. <laughs> The reference, of course, was to Henderson's 72 series heroics. In the meantime, here in Helsinki, Paul and others on Team Canada enjoyed Finland's world-famous saunas. And oh yes, they did play a tune-up game against a very outclassed Finnish national team. Team Canada won effortlessly eight to three. And one wonders if such an easy game helps or hinders when preparing to play against fellows like Yakushev, Karlamov, and Tretyak. After the series, Team Canada stopped in Prague for an encounter with a very strong Czechoslovakian national team. Granted that this game came at a time when Team Canada was let down after a tough eight-game series, nevertheless, the Czechs provided such a competitive challenge that one asks if Team Canada should have tuned up against this kind of opposition between games four and five.
Gothenburg was the site of Team Canada's other mid-series tune-up game. Facing the Swedish national team was a better test than the Finns. Team Canada triumphed 4-3, but without really extending themselves. In retrospect, one can't help but wonder about the overall effect of those eight days and two games between Vancouver and Moscow. Moscow, Shermetyevo Airport. Game five is just over 24 hours away as Team Canada arrives to be greeted by Canada's ambassador to the USSR, Mr. Robert Ford. The Soviet ground crew personnel were anxious to get a glimpse of the arriving Canadians as curious as the Canadians were about them and the Soviet Union. Several hours later, after laboriously clearing customs and immigration, and now too late to practice that day, Team Canada arrived at their downtown hotel, the Rossiya, the largest in Europe, which also housed Canadian fans who'd flown to Moscow to witness these final four games. Right on the Moscow River, this massive hotel is next to the Kremlin and Red Square, which unfortunately was under repair during this Canadian visit. Close by is St. Basil's Cathedral, probably the best known landmark in the entire country. This awe-inspiring piece of architecture dates back to Tsar Ivan the Terrible. The next day, a 20-minute bus ride through historic Moscow past the Bolshoi Ballet and Opera House. Through Moscow's wide avenues and along the Moscow River, delivered Team Canada to the Sports Palace, site of the four remaining games. Soviet broadcaster Nikolai Osarov arrives, as do several members of the Soviet team the series was about to resume here in a different world. The Soviet symbol of hospitality is a presentation of bread with salt. The pageantry of these customary opening ceremonies, the extra wide ice surface, the Slavic face, the clothes, especially the many, many uniforms, really make it abundantly clear that the USSR is a very different place from Canada. The chance to learn about our cultural differences is a bonus for all who take part in such an international series, be they participants or spectators. About five minutes into game five, and Alexander Moxa got his first of two goals. As usual, the Soviets were forechecking strongly, and when Vikulov gains control of the puck, three Canadian players go after him, leaving Moxa unchecked. Now let's look at some things which our cameras reveal about the Soviets' forechecking and their defensive strategy in general. They basically employ what they call their 2-1-2 two, two system when forechecking. The wingers usually both go for the puck carrier. The center 
waits out in a deep slot position, ready to react to the play and in a potentially good scoring position should his wingers get the puck. The defensemen play a very interesting and key role because they will penetrate deeply into the Canadian end to attempt to check the play should it start to come out on their side. And when this happens, notice that the centerman's job is to fall back to cover up for the defenseman. Now, this happens occasionally in Canadian hockey, too. But in Soviet hockey, it happens with almost programmed regularity. Canadian coaches don't want their defensemen getting trapped up ice, leaving the opposition with a three-on-two or a two-on-one. In traditional Canadian play, when two men go into forecheck, it's usually the two closest to the puck, with the third man hanging back, just the same as the Soviet center does. But then, when the play comes out on one side or the other, this forward goes to check, not the defenseman, as in Soviet play. Now, here's an example in game two in Toronto, where the Soviet system breaks down, and it results in a Team Canada goal. The problem here occurs when the centerman forgets to cover for the checking defenseman. Johnny McKenzie tips the puck fast, and it's Andre Lacroix and Bobby Hull, two on one for a goal. In the center zone, the Soviet centerman frequently turns around and skates backwards, the same as a defenseman, and plays at the head of a defensive triangle. The strategy is to angle the play toward either boards, and frequently it ends up that a defenseman and the center make the blue line stand instead of the two defensemen, as in Canadian play. And the Soviet defenseman, who's away from the play, cuts in behind the blue line to act as a safety, ready to retrieve the puck should it be shot in. The Soviets are very proficient at using the boards, much as a boxer uses the ropes to cut down the ring and corner his opponent. Soviet players will angle the puck carrier into the boards and out of skating room. This angling into the boards is usually done quite carefully, making absolutely certain that the man is squeezed out. The Russians are seldom interested in plastering a man into the boards, as so often happens in Canadian hockey. The hard-hitting tactic of the Canadian style has the advantage of being physically punishing, but it's also dangerous. Bad timing when you can miss your check and or the puck altogether. The Soviet system is not as intimidating, but it certainly can be frustrating. One other point about Soviet checking. Seldom do they retreat to take a stand at the blue line, giving the other team center ice. The Soviets, to steal a basketball term, have a full court press on at all times. Witness Gordy Howe being badgered by three men here in center ice. Not big tactical differences, but things which, when well executed, force Team Canada to react and adjust. The same as playing under international officiating standards requires adjustment. Much was said about Waldos Chapek's refereeing of Game 5. But was he causing Team Canada problems, or was it their failure to determine his standards and adjust to them? Billy Harris made this interesting statement at the time when he was choosing the team. I have found over the years that uh, for a hockey player to participate in international competition, he has to be mature, he has to be able to control his emotions. It's uh, quite different than playing on your own continent and playing in your own league. Team Canada's officials and players knew prior to this series that the Europeans had only recently switched to the one referee, two linesman system. They knew that their discretion and judgment, on penalties especially, would differ from what we're used to in our leagues. But under the white heat of international play, heads don't always stay cool. I think the game tonight was quite chippy, and I think this comes about from inconsistent officiating by the amateur officials who, I feel, uh, as part-time referees, do a pretty good job. Ralph Backstrom might disagree with his coach's assessment. Backstrom received a misconduct penalty when he complained about Valery Kalarmov going unpenalized after he kicked the feet out from under him. The discretion of the ruling is a little different over here, but actually all the game is just puck control, and if you have puck control, you got the game, regardless of what kind of rules you have, but the, uh, when you're losing, it's a little upsetting. 
puck controls the name of the game, spoken by a man who knows. And here comes Alexander Moxley to part his second goal of the evening as the Soviets won game five, three to two, to take a one-game lead in the series. Canada, as well as practicing, became tourists, taking in the sights. Souvenirs were a must. This is a state-operated Berioska store, where only tourists are allowed to shop, and all purchases must be made with foreign currency. were favorite items. Uh, everybody who comes here in uh, Moscow or Russia, he has to buy a hat uh, to take home. We wondered if Paul Henderson found Moscow any different this second time around. Well, I, I really think there's a lot of difference. I think uh, the number of cars in the street is unbelievable, and I think the clothes on the people, they're far more colorful, and uh, I'm getting out and seeing the city, and I'm having a great time. We're far more relaxed and we're just, everybody's having a great time this time. So win or lose, draw, we're having a, a good time. Too good, perhaps. By contrast, the Soviet team had but one free day when they were in Canada. And that wasn't until after the four games were over and they were on their way home via Montreal. Denim jeans and jackets proved to be their favorite purchase. Back in Moscow again, as Team Canada attends the official Canadian Embassy reception. We missed you in 72, oh, by God. <laughs> and after the hospitality of Ambassador and Mrs. Ford, it was off to the circus, leading one to ponder if all this extra activity was taking Team Canada's collective mind off its assigned mission. Certainly the players weren't eating, breathing, and sleeping hockey all the time they were in Moscow. On the other hand, they didn't plan this agenda for themselves. Game six started and finished on incidents revolving around Valery Kalarmov and Ricky Lee. Lee overskated the puck, and the ever-alert Kalarmov pounced on it, leading to a Soviet goal. In the third period, Kalarmov emerged from the penalty box just in time to split the defense and make the final score 5-2 to two for the Soviets. I think uh, if you remember back to the first game, it was the only game that he really put a burst of speed on and went between the defense and, uh, and uh, scored a goal on it, which was probably the nicest goal of the series. And uh, it seems to take a little bit away from his game by passing around in our system or our type of game that uh, Karmeloff would be much more effective uh, where we have an individual player than, uh, say, a team game. And as game six ended, Karmeloff and Ricky Lee met. The provocation, the retaliation, and the repercussions of this incident reverberated right back to the Canadian Senate. For our the speaker is Boris Kalagin. According to Soviet law, criminal law, the Canadian player who started that fight and injured our player. According to our criminal code, he should be jailed for 15 days. We call such people the sana non grata. In Canada, and later in the USSR, the Soviets' number six, Valery Vasilyev, dealt out some tremendous body checks. And here, in game six, right after this check on Bruce McGregor, another altercation broke out. According to my international rule book, the player that starts a fight in a fight is when somebody starts swinging at the opponent. It reads 10-minute penalty. The referee had already called a two-minute penalty on Vasiliev. 
which should have meant 12 minutes. McGregor did not throw a punch. At the worst, you get five minutes for retaliating. The call should have been 12 minutes for Vasiliev, five minutes for McGregor. Could somebody explain to me why it was five minutes apiece? Up to that point, it was a pretty good hockey game. Got a little chippy after that strange incident. Again, we wonder if Team Canada wouldn't have met with more success if they'd adjusted their game style to referee Dombrowski instead of allowing his inconsistencies and indecisiveness to get the better of them. Team Canada went to practice the next day, knowing they had to win both remaining games just to tie the series. Soviet hockey team has really done well, and uh, I think we've had more to They really do. They are a bit dirty, but uh, they know what they're doing, too. And uh, I just wish our team would play their hockey, and they were doing a little bit of the others. In the meantime, Boris Kalagin's boys enjoyed a brisk workout, knowing they needed only a tie to clinch the series. Watching intently were 50 Canadian amateur hockey coaches. A special tour group organized under the auspices of Hockey Canada and the CAHA. Receiving full cooperation from the Soviet Ice Hockey Federation, these Canadian coaches got first-hand insights about what it takes to be a coach in the Soviet Union. They attended a special lecture at Moscow's renowned Institute of Physical Culture and this practice session of the Red Army Bantam team. This is just one of the many exchanges of information ongoing now between Canada and other hockey nations. Communication fostered and encouraged by Hockey Canada. As we know, the Soviets make efficient use of what they call dry land training to condition their players. And often these fitness exercises are designed to simulate on ice activities. For instance, that youngster looks to be stick handling with that heavy iron bar. This inventive technique of the Soviets to devise year-round training methods, such as these skiers jumping off a synthetic surface when snow isn't available, has no doubt helped them to attain such finely conditioned international sportsmen. Incidentally, this ski jump is located in the Lenin Hills, overlooking the sports palace where this hockey series took place. And this vantage point is the favorite spot in all of Moscow for wedding party pictures. Game seven, do or die for Team Canada. And it proved to be a spectacular hockey match, perhaps the finest hour in the long and notable career of number 14, Ralph Backstrom, who scored two of Canada's four goals. Nobody gave more of himself in this series, game in and game out, than the 37-year-old Baxter. But Vladislav Tretyak, as usual, was at his stingy best in the Russian goal. Just as back in Canada, Tretyak, wearing his familiar wire mask, earned Team Canada's total respect. Another Soviet who attracted more attention as the series wore on was number 13, Boris Mikhailov, scoring the Soviets' fourth goal here in Game 7. Earlier in Canada, Jerry Cheevers had demonstrated a marked dislike over Boris's tendency to lurk in his goal crease. But apparently their differences were settled in gentlemanly fashion. Mikhailov, their captain, was described by Team Canada players as the very heart of the Soviet team. As Game 7 drew towards its conclusion, attention was drawn to the fact that the clock had kept running for several seconds while the play was actually stopped. Now here comes the most controversial incident of the entire series. 
Bobby Hull scores. The puck is in the net. In fact, it's on its way out again. Here it is again in split screen. Notice the lights behind the goal. Neither the green to signal the end of the game, nor the red to signal the goal is on. But the puck is definitely in the net. Now, by viewing a frame at a time, the green light comes on prior to the red. And referee Tom Brown ruled, in his best judgment, that the goal was scored after the conclusion of regulation time. To be fair, Brown made his call without the benefit of high-speed photography or a TV replay, and he called it as he saw it. But one can't help speculating about the effect of those valuable seconds that were lost when the clock was allowed to run during timeouts. The final score was officially 4-4. Four four. The Soviets had won the series. In the seven games, they'd outscored Canada 29-25. And this is a good time to look at the Soviet offensive strategy. They rely heavily on lightning speed counterattack as soon as they gain control of the puck. Here, Team Canada has the puck in their end, and the Soviet wingers are certainly not covering the Canadian pointman closely. The Soviet wingers like to worry those defensemen about potential fast breakaways. Now, as soon as one of their defenders gets the puck, it's up ice almost in the same motion. Very, very seldom will you see the Soviets take the puck in behind their own goal to slow the play down and get set up as you so often see Canadian clubs do. The Soviets also make many long cross-rink passes, a type of pass that Canadian hockey theorists consider quite dangerous because of the great possibility of interception. The Soviets like to make these long passes against the flow of play to catch the checkers going in the wrong direction. Here's why Canadian coaches think the long cross rink pass is a no-no. You heard what Gordy Howe said earlier about puck control and it's basic to the Russian game. Seldom ever will you see them shoot it in over the blue line. If their way is blocked to carry it in, they'll cut back, regroup, and try again. And the Soviet forwards have great flexibility of movement when on the attack. Left wingers come up on the right side and vice versa. And you'll often see the three Soviet forwards together over on one side of the rink, flooding a particular zone. And with their great passing skills, the manpower advantage they create in that flooded area is often enough to help them maintain possession and gain entry over the blue line or an excellent scoring chance. Of course, the trademark of the Soviet attacking game is precision passing around the goal. Picture plays. Well, I think the... Uh the effect of this series will be similar to the effect of the series two years ago. I think when you have international matches, there is an exchange of tactical ideas, plus there's an exchange of training methods. And when you have two hockey teams representing two different countries with different ideas, then I think the game of hockey is improved and it's beneficial for the spectators. Another off-day tour enjoyed by the visiting Canadian press and radio corps took them to the exhibition of economic achievement, where there were many interesting displays on the Soviet space program, another field where the Russians are beginning to exchange information with the West as they prepare for joint space missions. Game eight could not change the outcome of the series, but Jerry Cheevers did not let up. He played the way he played throughout. Both Cheevers and Tretiak played in seven games in the series, with Jerry allowing one less goal, 24 to 25. 
It's not surprising that the Soviet players said Cheever was the best goaltender they'd ever faced in international competition. This game was the final opportunity for Soviet fans to see Canadian hockey's living legend, Gordie Howe. Now in his 47th year, in a professional career that spanned almost 30 seasons, playing at this international level with his two sons, up against young men half his age. But he could still call on the skills and savvy that have made him the most revered player in the history of our game. But both teams had their big names. Yakushev, Hull, the series scoring leader, Kalamon, Backstrom, Tretiev, Chevers, Vasiliev, Stable, Howe. And every game had great moments of skill and finesse. For the most part, this series was a shining example to the youth of Canada, the USSR, and other hockey nations. Two years ago, I was interviewed, and uh, I felt the, the progress the Soviet hockey team has made over the last 10 years is almost frightening and two years ago I predicted within five years they'd be the champions of the world if they kept improving and coming up with great hockey players but I have that much respect for the Soviet team I feel they're probably the best hockey team in the world here's what coach Kalagin said after the series in the Soviet national magazine in my opinion the Canadian team was just as strong as the National Hockey League team we saw in 1972. I understand that they are already talking in Canada about the need to form 